Well, I want to say welcome to all of you who are with us today for this new series, uh, New Rules of Relationships. We are so glad you came. We're also glad you came uh, to be a part of our Do Something initiatives. My name's Ed Martin, and I am so glad that you're a part of this. I want to start by this series by asking you to imagine for a second that you've been made uh, the center focus of a new reality show. <laughs> Some of you uh, may have to think for a second where that would be, what rating that show would get. Most of us would just get dull. But uh, the purpose of this show is to figure out what are your rules for life? How, what are the rules you live your life by? Now, the truth is every one of us has rules we use for life. Most of them aren't written down. Most of them aren't stated. In fact, if I asked you what rules you live your life by, most of us, we wouldn't even be able to say them out loud. Uh, but everybody has rules. They're the way we relate to people at work, the way we relate to people in our family, the way we relate to everybody in our world. They're just the way we do life. Uh, for instance, some of you may operate by the rule of do unto others as they've done unto me. Uh, certainly when I was younger, m one of my rules in life was an eye for an eye. And I didn't say it that way. The way I said it was... <laughs> Hey, dude, you started it. You want to go? Uh, let's go. A lot of us live our lives by these unwritten rules. We have these rules of conduct for our lives, for our family, for the way we treat people at work, for the way we treat people in our neighborhood. We don't say them out loud, but they govern our behavior. And they are the reasons why we get along with some people and the reason we don't get along with other people. And then for most of us that are joining in today... We're followers of Christ. Now, I get that many of you here aren't yet, and we're so glad you're here. And th the good news about this series for you is that everything we're going to talk about over the next few weeks is applicable to you, and you'll be able to apply in your life, and it will change your relationships. Uh, whether you follow Jesus, believe that any of this is true, if you just try it, it really will make a difference in your life. And the other good part of it is, over the next few weeks, we're going to show you what how Christians are supposed to live, what the rules are for how we're supposed to live in our relationships with other people. So you can now say to your Christian friends, say, no, that ain't right. That's not what you're, the way you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do it this way. But for those of us who are followers of Christ, it gets even more complicated in this rules for how we do our life. And one of the things I didn't realize when I became a Christian is, you know, if you grew up in the church, there's there's this thing that apparently, I don't know how it got taught, but I've seen it everywhere where you, you learn to compartmentalize. Now, nobody, I think, uses that word, but what I mean by this, and you've probably seen this, is there's one way that you relate in your relationship with God, and you treat God this way, and you expect God to treat you a certain way, and it's all quiet and holy and loving and good and full of grace. And then there's a way you treat everybody else in your world. So there's this thing you do with God and you come and you feel so close to God and you relate to God and you're so thankful for your relationship with God and it's peaceful in your relationship with God and you feel great. But in your normal life, your life is chaotic and dysfunctional and the way you treat people is not all that good. And those two, they don't have any relationship with each other. I mean, often there's just this huge gap between the way I do my relationship with God and we're good and I'm so spiritual and I feel so close there's a huge gap between that and the way I treat and act toward everybody in my world so we go around and we come to church and we get in our small groups and we feel close to God and the people that are nice to us and we pray for people over here that they'll act better so they can be more like us and there's just this divide between the way we relate to God and the way we relate to other people. Which I guess would work out okay if you just didn't care what the Bible had to say about any of that. Because when you begin to read the New Testament of the Bible and you begin to understand how the people who follow Jesus closely and then explained in the rest of the New Testament how we're to apply his teachings to life. In fact, even when you hear Jesus, here's what you learn. And... And this is so different than the way some of us have compartmentalized our life. You begin to learn that the measure for my relationship with God, the measure of my maturity with my relationship with God, the measure of how close I am to God, is measured by, is seen in, 
the maturity of my relationship with other people. I mean, did you get that? That the measure of the maturity of my relationship with God is seen by, is measured in, the maturity of my relationship with other people. In fact, this is seen by, talked about by almost every New Testament writer. Let me just show you some of this, and I'll start with our leader himself. Here, here's something Jesus said. Jesus said, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, in other words, if you're in worship and you've brought a gift to God, you're worshiping God, and there you remember while you're in church that your brother over here has something against you, what do you do? Well, you leave your gift at the altar, and you go make it right with your brother. You first go be reconciled to your brother, then you come and you offer your gift to God. Now, I don't know how much you've hung around church, but that is not the way that we normally see it. In fact, the way we see it is we say, hey, come and get right with God and get your relationship right with God and get close to God, and you pray for people that you have problems with or have problems with you over here. You're right with God, and you pray for people that you have problems with over here before you do anything about it. And God says, no, that, that's not the way we do it. You don't need to talk to me about them. You... <laughs> You go talk to them and, and then come back and let's do the thing between me and you. Uh, the health of your relationship with God is seen in the maturity and health of your relationship with other people. Uh, look at this one. This one is uh, from a, a follower of Jesus named John. And John uses the analogy of light and darkness. And light, of course, is your closeness with God and darkness is being out of relationship with God. Here, here's what he says. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother in his, is in darkness and walks around in darkness, he does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. He says, hey, you can't walk around saying, hey, I got this thing going on, me and God, we got it going on, and we're all good, but these people over here, I can't stand them. I don't want anything to do with them. You can't separate your relationship with people that God has put in your life and your relationship with God. I'll show you one more. This one, again, is from Jesus. Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you tithe. Oh, wait a minute, that's not right. <laughs> if, if you love one another. People will know that you follow me, not by your church attendance, not, not by how close you, how much you sing the worship songs or raise your hands. People will know that you follow me by the way you treat people in your world. Now, that's a little bit disturbing if you watch any much of how followers of Jesus, how we live. Because if the most important thing is that I love God, I love that. Because you can't measure that. I mean, you, you can't see my heart and my heart, and I'm so spiritual, and God and I are so close, and we got it going on, and I pray so much, and I love the Lord. I just love the Lord. But if I have to love my neighbor as myself, if I have to pray for my enemies, if I have to bless those who hurt me, that's visible. That's tangible. That you can see. And all throughout the New Testament, it says... The health and maturity of my relationship with God is seen in, is measured by the health and maturity of my relationship with the people that God has put in my life. And it would be a whole lot easier. I mean, it would just be so much easier if Christianity were a religion that focused on me and God and say these prayers and do this thing and pray these, this certain way and act this certain way when you're in the temple because God isn't all that worried about other people. God will take other people, will care of other people. You don't have to think about them. But here's what Jesus is saying. I mean, he says it again and again. Who cares if you feel this close relationship with God? What matters to me is I measure your love and your commitment to me by your love and commitment to the people that I have put in your life. Because as we're going to see over the next few weeks, as we talk through in this series, the lens through which I am to work out my relationships with people in the world, the the way I'm to see my relationship with God 
is almost exactly the same lens through which I see my relationship with you. See, because if, if you're a follower of Christ, I mean, I just tell you, if, if we could ever fully get, if we could ever grasp how to the lengths to which God has gone to be in relationship with us, how far God, God has gone, the grace he has given, how much he has done to accept us, how much it's taken for him to love us, if we would begin to ever grasp the life that he has given us in Jesus, it would change the way we view the relationships that we have with other people. In fact, if there is one clear teaching of Jesus, it, it, all throughout his teaching, it, it, it's one practical message, it's like this. They're going to know that you follow me by the way that you love other people. Not by your church, not by your religious drills, not by the things you do, not by the things that you feel. They will know that you are my followers by the way that you treat them. Now, I want to look with you today uh, to get this whole thing started at, at a, a book that, and it's not really a book, it's a letter written by a follower of Jesus named Paul. He writes to a city called Ephesus, and so the book is called The Letter of Ephesians. He's writing to a group of Christ followers in a city called Ephesians, and they're a brand new group of followers, and they live in a world that's really very familiar to you in, in, in this, in that they believed there was a spiritual life and then there was the rest of your life. And there were things that were spiritual and you could be very spiritual and it didn't have all that much to do with how it affects your life. And Paul addresses this issue with them of this distance between these two lives and he's trying to give them the context and what he talks about is the context for what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. And before we get into that, I just I want to give you some examples of how deep this divide was in, in their kind of world that the way that they were thinking about life and the culture they were ingrained in, it, it's just the way that they saw the world. In fact, the religious leaders of their day had these little games that they would play to prove that they were very close to God and it didn't have anything to do with how they treated other people. In fact, they believed that the closer you got to God, that could be seen in how much you distanced yourself from other people. Can you imagine that there would be a group of religious people that could see that the way you show that you are so close and so holy to God is that you don't have very much to do with people who don't share those values. You distance yourself from those people. And they had games they had played just so they didn't have to help other people so they could prove my relationship with God is good and doesn't, this doesn't affect it at all. One of them had to do with their money, which always is, you know, one that's, brings up and gets all of us and their stuff they played this game where they would come and they would dedicate everything they had to god i have dedicated everything i have to god my house is god's my money is god all my stuff everything i have is god's in fact they had a little ceremony where they would ceremonially dedicate everything to god and the reason they did it is then when somebody would come to them a poor pe person would come to them in need they could say oh i'm so sorry I'd love to help you, but I have dedicated everything I have to God. It's already been given to God. Now, they'd even go further in that, in that they would come to their aging parents who needed help, and when their aging parents would ask them for help, these religious leaders would say, Oh, Mom and Dad, you know how you raised me to love God and to be committed to God? I have committed my life to God. I have committed everything to God. I've given everything I have to God. Therefore, I can't help you, Mom and Dad, because everything I have has been given to God. Now, you, you think about that, and, and you go, that is so weird. But the truth is, if you think about it a little bit, you, you don't have to see that we do similar things. And you can imagine, in fact, I think one of the, one of the reasons that Jesus winds up getting crucified is that these people hated it when Jesus would watch that kind of stuff, and he'd go... <laughs> wrong you can't say that you've got it going on with god over here and that you've dedicated something to god and you don't care how you treat people in your life you got to stop thinking you are so close to god and you pray and you give and you do the ceremonies and the drill and you dress up and you think you got it going on and you keep distancing yourself from people that god loves the health of your relationship with god 
is seen in and measured by the health of your relationships with the people that God has put in your life. So a major part of the New Testament writings is just the people who follow Jesus helping the people in their world confront this culture and this thing that was in them that I'm so spiritual and I'm spiritual, I'm a very spiritual person, but I, it doesn't affect how I treat other people in my life. It's trying to help them understand that the way I treat people, it has a big impact on my relationship with God. That as I understand the invitation that I have been given, that these followers of Christ, that we who are followers of Christ have been given by God through Jesus, when we understand that, it impacts the relationships in our world. Here's how uh, the Apostle Paul, who writes this letter, this is how he says it. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, as a person who's committed to the Lord, I've, I've been captured by him, I'm a prisoner of his, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. And the word literally invitation, I mean, a, a calling means I I invitation. He's saying, you've been invited. Hey, you've been invited into this unbelievable relationship with God through, through Jesus. I want you now to live a life that is worthy of the invitation you've received. Now, when we hear that, if we just go by what we see in the 21st century by followers of Christ, we'd expect him to say, live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Therefore, go to church all the time. Pray all the time. You ought to distance yourself from other people. You shouldn't see movies like that. You shouldn't talk like that. You shouldn't do things like that. You shouldn't go over there. You shouldn't be with those people. You, shouldn't, you should stand up for the values and not have anything to do with people that do not share your values. You need to pray more. That's the way you live a life that's worthy of the calling that you have received. Instead, Paul immediately goes in to relational stuff. Paul, I want to live a life worthy of the calling I've received. How do I do that? Verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. To which we say, well, wait a second. That's people stuff. Uh, that, that's stuff that would affect how I treat my boss that that's how I would treat the people who are in authority over me that's that's stuff that has something to do that changes the way that I think about my rights and my the way I react with other people I, I just want to live a life that's worthy of the calling that I've received from God he says okay be completely humble and gentle be patient with one another in love to which we say what does that have to do with anything about being worthy of the invitation I've received from God. And God would say, and, and don't miss this, the standard, the standard is for how you treat other people, the standard is how I have treated you. That once you understand the invitation that I have given you, the way you treat other people, the standard for that, the, the rule for that is you treat other people not how they deserve, but how I have treated you. The first thing he says is, be completely humble, which most of us think we've got completely covered, and most of the people who know us know that we do not. <laughs> but even if, even if we realize we don't, we go, but what does that have to do with anything anyway? Why does it matter? Here's why. Because when you understand the degree to which your heavenly Father, and I'm telling you if you if if you could get this into if we could get this into us it would change so much about us when we understand the degree to which our heavenly father has humbled himself for us the bible says that when jesus went to the cross came to this earth went to the cross to die for us he humbled himself for our sake what that means is he put our need above his need jesus put us above him he put our deal above his deal. He sacrificed himself for us. He put us above him. To which we say, but she doesn't deserve me doing that for her. Exactly. You didn't deserve it either. That's exactly the point. You treat people the way I've treated you. To live a life worthy of the calling is to live out the invitation that I have given you and to treat people the way that I have treated you. And then he uses the word, be gentle. 
Now, this one bothers me a little bit, and if you know me, you know why. I have not uh, ever in my life been called a gentle person, and it honestly it conf conflicts a little bit with with my manhood. I mean, I, or something in my head. I, I I can't imagine a guy getting called into his boss's office and the boss closing the door and sitting him down and going, "Hey, I just need to tell you, you're the most gentle person in our office." I I, I don't want that. I, I, and I didn't make a whole lot of progress on this, and I didn't do a great service to my family with this of not being gentle because, again, it just it didn't make sense to me with being a man until I finally understood maybe I had the wrong definition. You know, the word gentle, the one that we read here, it, the original language that Paul uses, it means a horse, a, a strong horse who allows itself to be controlled by a rider with, with reins. It's a horse who has, still has all of its strength, but it submits itself. It's, it's a matter of submission to one who, who controls you. And what that means for me practically is it, it means when I'm in a situation where you're the boss, where, where you're the parent, where you're, where you're the one in charge, where you're the one that gets to say, he says in those situations where you're tempted to power up and make people do what you want them to do, you remember that your heavenly father, when he had the opportunity to power up with all the promises you broke, all the times you said to God, God, I'll never again, and God, get me out of this, and that'll never happen again, with all the times you said, God, never again, this will never happen, and then you went right back to it, when God could have powered up on you, God intentionally served you. God intentionally humbled himself. You treat each other gently, not because anybody deserves it but because that's how god has treated you then he says i want you to be patient with people now some of us are like well i'm just not very patient in fact i hear people all the time particularly christian people i just wish you wouldn't say this as saying hey don't pray for patience because then you know it's like you're going to get trouble and the only way god is going to be able to make you patient is give you trouble hey if god wants you to be patient which he does and trouble is the only way to get it you don't need to pray for it you need to get prepared but the good news is that's not the only way patience can grow in your life. Paul says, I want you to treat each other patiently. But I'm not patient. How do I do it? Paul says, then you see it through the lens of your relationship with God. You look at that other person through the lens of how God has treated you. You remember how patient your heavenly father has been with you. You remember all the times that you said, God, this will never happen again, never again, never again, never again. And then you did it again. You remember all the times that you ran and how God, he, he followed you. He stayed with you. Paul just says, okay, now with that in mind, I want you to be patient with them. Not because they deserve it. Not because it's your natural tendency to be patient. I want you to get so focused on this unbelievable invitation you've been given by God through Jesus to be in relationship with him. I want you to see every relationship in your world through that lens. You're like, Ed, I don't... You're saying I should be patient, but I've told my, I've told my kid a thousand times and they keep doing it. That has no comparison between me and my relationship with God. You're right. It has no comparison. Your treason before God, your sin before God was much greater. I mean, when you think about what you have done and how patient God has been with you and all the times you, you stand and you go, you want to be patient? They'll go, God, through high school and through college and through many Saturday nights and through many spring breaks and again and again in my first marriage and my second marriage you were so patient with me you were patient with me and now my daughter's 10 minutes late and I want to kill her there's no comparison God says you you be patient not because they deserve it but because I have been patient with you and then he says bear with one another literally that word means bear with what's unbearable people who just drive you crazy he says you bear with them not because it's in you not again because the, i mean they don't deserve it they're unbearable but because your heavenly father bore with you for so many years 
And if you want to live a life worthy of the invitation that you have received from God, followers of Christ, if you want to live a life worthy of what's been given to you, then what's been given to you becomes the standard for the relationships you have with other people. And when things become unbearable, you remove your focus from the other person and you focus on God who bore with me for so many years, who waited on me for so many years, who was patient with me for so many years. And in light of that, I bear with you. And then he goes on and he says some stuff that's pretty deep. Let me explain it, I think. Make every effort, he says, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Essentially, what he's saying is make every effort. You make every effort You make every effort you can to guard. That means you consider this to be precious. You consider being in unity with other people in your world. You consider it something you have to guard, something that will be attacking it, something that will come against it. You make every effort to preserve it in your world. In other words, it's not going to always be evil, easy. People aren't always going to act the right way. People aren't always going to treat you the way that they should treat you. It's going to seem like it's impossible, but... You're tenacious in your relationships with people because God has been tenacious in his relationship with you. You tried to run and you tried to bail and you've screwed up again and again and again. And every time when you turned around and there was trouble, your heavenly father was there with you. He was with you in the same way. You don't bail out on relationships easily. You don't bail out on the people that I have put in your world, just like I have done everything I could to guard my relationship with you. And then he says, and this is kind of long, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, what does that have to do with anything that he's been talking about? Well, Here's what I think he's saying. He's saying, look, in the midst of your relationships, there are going to be times when you're going to think, this is never going to change. There is nothing I can do. This is never going to be any different. There's, There's nothing that's going to change that. And when you're in those relationships in that time, he says, I want you to remember, I want you to remember, I want you to remember that your heavenly father is God. And he is over all and in all and through all, and he has gone to great lengths for you to bring you together with him. And he will continue to work in your life in the future. So don't you give up on people just because you can't see any progress in your life. Implication? Well, let's just face it. Some of you who are joining in today... If, if we just look back a year or two years, it, if we had looked back a few years ago and somebody in your life had just said to you, hey, in a year, in, in two years, you're going to be going to church and you're going to know some of the words of the song and you're going to like it and you're going to sing and you're going to enjoy going, you'd have gone, right, I'm going to enjoy it. I mean, there are people, there are some of us There are people in your world that have said about you, some of you have had people say it to you, you will never change. She will never change. He will never be any different. She has no need. She has no desire. She has nothing that's going to change her. Yet here you are, and you live completely different than you did a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. They couldn't see it. But now you know. God is bigger than all that. God is at work in all of that. And just like your heavenly father didn't bail out on you, even when all those people seem to think that nothing could ever change you, you have to remember there is one God and Father who is over all and is working in all and through all, and he is doing it in Christ. One Lord, one faith. He's bringing all of us together. And he asked that the acceptance and the love and the grace that he gave in his relationship. We offer to other people, and then we stand back, and we let God do what only he can do, which is to bring about the change that sometimes seems impossible. You see, 
When those of us who are followers of Christ lose sight of the significance of the relationship, the invitation that's been given to us by God through Jesus, when we lose sight of what's been done for us in Jesus, inevitably when we lose sight of this, our relationship over here get out of track. Because as long as it's just you and me, I mean, if you hang around me long enough, it won't even take that long, and I'll give you something to be angry at me about. If you and I get close enough together, I'll rub you in such a way that eventually you'll go, there's no way I could ever forgive that. If it's just you and me, probably you and I won't be able to be in a relationship very long as long as it's you and me. If we're just going to be based on what you and I do to each other, if that's all it is, our relationships are going to get strained again and again and again but Paul says to us what Jesus said if in the middle of that somehow I remember what God has done for me in Christ Jesus instead of thinking well he didn't she didn't know she said she lied she she made me look bad in front of other people instead of making that the focus of my relationship with you if I remember this is what God has done for me in Christ how he loved me, how he accepted me, how he came to me, how he treated me, how he bore with me when I was unbearable to him. Then I'll treat other people differently. It, can cha it completely changes the way I move to them. And when that's the focus of my relationship with you, you will be amazed how patient you will be, how giving you will be, and all the love that God will develop in your life toward the people in your world. You'll be amazed at your ability to bear with people that seem unbearable. But when you lose sight of this, this almost always gets off track. Well, that's what we're going to talk about for the next several weeks in this series, New Rules on Relationships. And I'm telling you, if you will measure your relationship with God just by you and God, you will inevitably mess up your relationships with other people because the health of your relationship the maturity of your relationship with God is always seen in measured by the relationships with other people in your world so could I right now talk to you for just a minute about some next steps a little bit ago uh, the campus pastor said to you hey hold on to this card and on the back of it it'll talk to you about next steps in the message today well Now's that time. If you would take a connection card off your chair, and if you haven't done it already, if you just put your name on there, or maybe a number where we could text you. I know most people prefer to be in contact by text these days, or maybe an email address. All we're going to do is just let you know how glad we are that you're here. We're not going to do anything weird with that. We just want to be able to pray for you and let you know that we're with you and that we're willing to help in any way you can. And we believe that every time when you come and, and you're here, he didn't come by accident that God has something he wants you to see, to say, to, to do, to, a next step to take. And if you're new around here and you're not ready to take any next step on this, maybe the only next step that you can honestly take is just to say, hey, I'll come back and I'll learn and I'll see if I can grow in my trust with God and, and with these people. But if you're a follower of Christ, here's what I want to say to you today. You maybe were raised in a tradition where Sunday was all about being holy and reverent. It was you and God and how you felt between you and God. And that didn't really have much to do with how you treated other people in your life. I have to tell you, the God of the Bible doesn't put much stock in this vertical part that you have that does not affect the horizontal in your world. For you, for many of us who are followers of Christ, the next step will be that you need to deal with your Heavenly Father's call to love the people that he has placed in your life. So would you consider checking the box today that says, I will this week pray for a person I don't like. See, for most of us, our prayers are personal and they're about us and our needs, but there's a command in the Bible that we pray for those who persecute us, those who hurt us. We, we bless our enemies, that we are actively trying to bless those that we don't like. And Almost all of us have somebody we don't like. It's, it's your mom, it's your, your sister, it's your brother, it's your boss, it's the person at work that they've said things about you. It's, it's your neighbor. 
Would you take the step this week to say, I'll be obedient and I will pray blessings for that person. I will pray for that person. God consistently makes it clear that our horizontal relationship is an indication of our relationship with him. And I'm telling you, when the invitation of what he has done for you becomes front and center in your relationship with other people, you'll forgive and you'll love and you'll accept and things will change in the way you treat people. Maybe for many of you, the next step you need to say, if you can't take that one, is just to say, this week I'm going to figure out where I'm relationally off in my world that I've been covering up by saying, I'm okay with God. I'm okay with God. If you take that step, you'll be ready as we take the next steps in this series. Now let me say something to one other group of people before I'm done today. If, if you've joined with us today and you wouldn't consider yourself a church person or you used to be a church person and you now have a friend that you trust enough that you came back or maybe you just wandered in because you just felt drawn for some reason. Can I tell you what probably happened to you in the past with you in the church? And you're thinking, no, you can't tell me because you weren't there. Let, let me tell you what I, I, I think probably happened with you in the past. You got hurt in the church because forgiven people forgot that they were supposed to forgive you. You got hurt because people who had been accepted unconditionally by God, they wouldn't accept you. You got hurt because people who had been included with God in his family based on nothing they had earned would not include you. Can I say to you that I'm so sorry? And could I say to you would, you, would you try to give your heavenly father a second chance because he's way better than we are. And we so often get it wrong, but all the things that I have said today that are true about how he feels about you, they're true. And would you consider trying again to open yourself up to him, to follow him again? And I want to say on behalf of our church, we want to be a community to get this right. We don't all the time. But we want to be a community where you and us, we together learn how to love our Heavenly Father and love the people in our world. And we're so honored that you came to be a part of us. And we hope you'll come back. Let's bow together, and I'll pray for all of us. Now, Father in heaven, I am so thankful for your love, for your grace, for your acceptance, for your inclusion, for all of this relationship that you've offered to our world, to me, unconditionally. I'm thankful for Jesus and what he's done for us. Now, I pray for everyone here who's already said they're a follow Jesus, that those things would become forefront in our mind, not just so we would feel close to you, but so it would become the lens through which we see every person in our world and what you have done for us, we would do for them. And God, I pray for every person here that's not yet follower of yours, that your invitation, that your offer would be so attractive to them that they'd want it and they accept it, and they begin to move toward you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.